Hello, and welcome to Past, the podcast about those who would never rule. I'm Veronica Fortune, and this week's episode is Charles of Orleans, Part 4. Welcome back. When we left things, we're starting to look up for Charles' supporters back in France. For Charles, though, things are going to seem a bit sad. In England, Charles arranged the sale of many of his treasured possessions from Blois, his favorite residence. He basically stripped most of the movable goods, including his tapestries and jewels. Sadly, he also had to sell his library. He was lucky, though. His captors in England, various friends back in France, and just people who knew him would send him books regularly. He will actually return with over 100 volumes when he gets back to France. These books were less lighthearted than his books in France. They were medical texts, psalters, Bibles, books of hours, the works of St. Augustine and St. Gregory, and a prayer book that he had made that contained both French and English prayers. And this gets us to his poetry. And if you hear my voice crack in the next bit, it's because, yes, I'm fighting back tears. His words are beautiful, even read today in French, which I don't speak fluently. A great deal of his work related to missing his wife, Bonne of Armagnac. I can only imagine how horrible her life had been with him gone, losing her father and not being able to see her husband. And it's clear from his words that even though they hadn't known each other for long, he cared deeply for her. An interesting note, unlike almost all his contemporaries, he had no illegitimate children. Charles writes to Bond that he will keep a brave face until he sees her again. These poems deal with his feelings of loneliness and despair that he'll never see Bond or his home again, that he can make it through knowing she is there for him, how he feels that his loss of freedom is punishment from God for France's decadence and decay. He thinks that France needs to find its ancient virtue. Yes, some parts feel a bit these kids these days. But he's thinking about how things can get better. And his love of poems may read as formulaic to us, but that's because they are the formula. While Charles was writing some of the most touching poetry of his age, his home was about to be attacked. It is considered a violation of the rules of chivalry to attack an imprisoned person's land. But Bedford decided to ignore this guideline and allowed his forces, led momentarily by Thomas Montague, the fourth Earl of Salisbury, to attack the city of Orléans. This, of course, would actually be the beginning of the end for English hold on France, but not for Charles' stay in England. The city of Orléans was besieged for just under seven months until the siege was lifted by a French peasant girl, Joan of Arc. Now, if you want a full account of this, you'll have to go listen to my special episode on Patreon. Please come join us. But just a brief outline. Salisbury dies in the opening days and is replaced by William de la Pole, the Earl of Suffolk. He'll become the Duke of Suffolk in a few years before having the shortest banishment in history ever. You should remember Suffolk from Richard III, Duke of York's episodes, or when I mentioned him in the first episode. And everything that makes him one of the villains to Richard III, Duke of York, makes him a hero to Charles of Orléans. After the siege was lifted and the bastard could leave the city, he and Alençon joined Joan on her divine mission to free France from the English and see Charles VII crowned. On this mission, the bastard actually captured Suffolk and then released him on what most would consider rather easy terms. Apparently, the two got along well, and the bastard seemed to realize Suffolk would be able to help him in the long run. Part of this does include helping pay for part of John's ransom. During this period, the English, of course, noticed that Charles VII had been crowned and realized it might be time to get young Henry VI crowned, and Henri II as well. First, he had to be crowned in England. And this happened on the 6th of November, 1429. Not long after Henry VI's crowning, Charles was moved again. This time he was given to John Cornwall, who had been a retainer of Clarence's. Cornwall, due to his own machinations, actually held the right to a minor but substantial portion of John's ransom. With this new housing situation, Charles and the bastard were hoping to get John out of England. 
A rather complicated plan was hatched that partially involved calling in a favour of Suffolk and trying to raise a huge sum to pay the provost of Paris for one of the Beaufort heirs, and then to trade all of that for John. It didn't work out, as of course, as you'll find things don't go well for John for a long time. As you can probably tell, Charles's time in captivity was mainly spent reading, writing, waiting for news, maybe some exercise, but it really was nothing exciting. I have no doubt he would have loved to have been fighting in France, and in 1432, he would have given anything to be in France. That year, his only daughter died at 22. Jane and Alençon hadn't had any children, but their marriage was, by all accounts, happy, and he was saddened by her death. Alençon and Charles will be close throughout the rest of their lives. It would be five years before he married again, and unlike his father-in-law, he was literally free to do so. It appears that months later, based on his letters, his wife Bon died as well. This death almost broke Charles. His poems from this time period show despair in a way I can't imagine feeling and I hope to never have to feel. It's made even worse because he had received word that she was ill, only then to get word that she was recovering before being crushed by the news that she was gone. Now, I have a bit of a treat for you. My friend Emmanuel from Lafayette We Are Here will be reading one of Charles' poems for you. Emmanuel's podcast is an English-language podcast about French history from a Frenchman. It is really great to hear parts of history from a French perspective. I will be reading the English translation of this poem. It's important to note that Charles was writing in late Old French and early Middle French, and Emmanuel, as a modern French person, speaks modern French. To keep the flow of the poem, he will be using modern French. Just wanted to make sure, if you find this poem, it won't be a huge change, but it's enough that you'll notice. I will be leaving a link to Lafayette We Are Here in the show notes and on social media, so please give it a look. And without further ado, here's Emmanuel. La mort qui t'a fait si hardi de prendre la noble princesse qui était mon confort, ma vie, mon bien, mon plaisir, ma richesse. Puisque tu as pris ma maîtresse, prends-moi aussi son serviteur, car j'aime mieux prochainement mourir que languir en tourment, en peine, souci et douleur. Là, de tout bien est égarni, et en droite fleur de jeunesse, je prie à Dieu qu'il te maudit, fausse mort pleine de rudesse. Si prise l'eut sans vieillesse, ce ne fut pas si grand rigueur, mais prise la hâtivement et m'a laissé piteusement, en peine, souci et douleur. Là, je suis seul, sans compagnie. Adieu, madame, ma liesse. Or est notre amour départi. Non pourtant, je vous fais promesse que de prière à largesse, morte vous servirez de cœur sans oublier aucunement, et vous regretterez souvent, en peine, souci et douleur. Dieu, surtout souverain Seigneur, ordonné par grâce et douceur, de l'âme d'elle, tellement qu'elle ne soit pas longuement, en peine, souci et douleur. Charles d'Orléans And now in English. Alas, death, who made you so bold, to take the noble princess who was my comfort, my life, or good, my pleasure, my wealth. Since you have taken my mistress, take me also her servant, for I would sooner rather mourn than languish in torment, in grief, care, and pain. Alas, of all goods was furnished, and in the right flower of youth, I pray to God that he curses you, false death, full of harshness. If taken in old age, it would not have been so severe. I took it hastily and left me miserably in grief, care, and pain. Alas, I am alone, without company. Farewell, my lady, my jubilation. But our love is gone. Now, however, I promise you that many prayers with generosity ort will serve as your heart without forgetting in any way, and you will often regret in sorrow, worry, and pain. God, on all sovereign Lord, order by grace and sweetness of the soul of her, so that she is not long in trouble 
care and pain. While Charles was dealing with a great deal of sadness, his living arrangements were changed again. This time, though, he was moved to the care of William de la Pole, then the Earl of Suffolk. This was probably his nicest move, at least until he had his freedom. De la Pole was an educated man who we would probably call a man of letters. He loved reading in general and had a vast library. He was even married to Alice Chaucer, the granddaughter of Geoffrey Chaucer, who I understand tortures some people with his writing. Suffolk wrote ballads, and most importantly for Charles, he was in favor of peace with France, even if it meant losing France. Yes, this may not have been a popular stance with Humphrey of Gloucester or other English leaders, Richard III, Duke of York, looking at you, but it was about to be popular with the king, who was only 10 at this point. And it was always popular with the French, well, except the Burgundian French and only sometimes. While Suffolk wasn't going to be breaking Charles out of jail, he did make his stay more comfortable. Charles basically became his companion, and he was treated as though he was almost a member of the family. Well, if having a few guards was part of being the family. Suffolk would do all he could throughout Charles' stay to get him back to France. And I will say, the two formed what we would consider today a proper friendship. Charles's cause received a boost in a sad way in November of 1432, when Anne of Burgundy died. Anne was the sister of Philip the Good and had been married to John, Duke of Bedford, since 1423. The couple had no children but had a happy marriage. Her death would lead to the deterioration of the relationship between Bedford and Philip the Good. Bedford remarried less than a year later to Jaquetta of Luxembourg without consulting his former brother-in-law. Philip, as someone who was, well, more than mildly self-important, was not pleased with this lack of consultation. Around the time of his sister's death, Philip the Good had signed a temporary truce with Charles VII, and Bedford will do little to help bring Philip back to his side in general. The English, French, and Burgundians actually had peace talks at Auxerre that broke down, at least temporarily, due to Charles VII's demands. The meeting, which had started in December of 1432, was postponed until March and moved to Calais. If you're curious, Charles VII had demanded that the surviving French prisoners from Agincourt be allowed to participate. Suffolk was actually in favor of this and wrote to Henry VI to try to make it happen. Charles even wrote to Henry to ask for permission to go, and Henry agreed to this. Charles would remain in Dover with Bourbon, where they were brought in March of 1433, while the English embassy waited for the French and Burgundians in Calais. Charles and Bourbon hadn't seen each other in almost 18 years at this point. While Bourbon had been well cared for, he was mentally and emotionally broken. Throughout his imprisonment, Bourbon had written to Henry VI regularly, asking for his freedom. And even though he had been cared for, his health was beginning to fail. Charles wrote a ballad for France, and Emmanuel will be reading it for you now. En regardant vers le pays de France, un jour m'advint à Douvres sur la mer, qu'il me souvint de la douce plaisance que je soulais au dix pays trouvés. Si commençait de cœur à soupirer, combien certes que grand bien me faisoit de voir France que mon cœur et mes doigts. Je m'avisais que c'était non s'avance de tels soupirs dedans mon cœur gardé, vu que je vois que la voix commence de bonne paix qui tout bien peut donner. Pour ceux, tournait en confort mon pensée, mais non, pourtant mon cœur ne se lassoit de voir France que mon cœur et mes doigts. Alors, Chargé en la nef d'espérance, tous mes souhaits en leur priant d'aller outre la mer sans faire demeurance, et à France de me recommander. Or, nous donne Dieu bonne paix sans tarder, à donc aurait loisir, mais qu'ainsi soit, de voir France que mon cœur et mes doigts. Paix et trésor que l'on peut trop louer, je hais guerre, point ne doit la priser. Détourbé ma longtemps, soit tort ou droit, de voir France que mon cœur et mes doigts. Charles d'Orléans. And now in English. From Dover Castle, beyond the sea, I recalled the delights 
fair chance had brought me in that dear country. Heart sighs the memory drew from me, thinking how sweet if I might but go and visit that France that I love so. I knew the folly of such a stance. T'was unwise to sigh in such degree. Within my heart I saw perchance the road to peace opening presently. Thus solace came to set thought free. My heart still longed to voyage, though, and visit that France that I love so. Thus with my yearnings at a glance, I loaded Hope's vessel with the plea that over the waters they might dance and commend me to France speedily. May God bring peace and not tardily, for if it come, I the same might know and visit that France that I love so. Peace is a treasure praised endlessly. I hate war and prize it not, you see. For rightly or wrongly, I cannot go and visit that France that I love so. Charles and Bourbon, as you can probably guess, would be waiting for something that would never come. Their compatriots and the supporters of Charles VII didn't show up. For Bourbon, this would pretty much be the end. He died on the 15th of January, 1434. Seeing everything that had been going on, Charles VII's military wins, and the English crown not showing him the respect he wanted, Philip the Good started to realize he might need to change sides and make peace with the man who killed his father. Charles VII realized that he should probably start making peace with Philip as well. Philip, prior to making this peace, sent an embassy to England in July of 1434. He wanted to learn how the English felt about the war in general, and he wanted his ambassador to meet with Charles and to find out Charles's take on the war. At this point, Henry VI is almost 13 and starting to take more control of his government. Charles has been a prisoner for almost 19 years. One thing I want to make clear here, until he started having mental health issues, and even most of the time after, Henry VI was a kind man. He was thoughtful and intelligent. In fact, every single historian I have ever referenced who has written anything about Henry VI makes it clear. He was just not good at kinging. While his means of trying to get peace were, well, poor, his goal was always true. He was a lover of peace. When he met with Philip's ambassador, he expressed that he was saddened when Charles VII hadn't come to the earlier conference in March. And Henry shared that he knew Charles, as in our Charles, was ready to work for peace. Henry even let the ambassador know that the war was costly for the English. Further, the ambassador found that the English in general weren't keen on the Burgundians. But the king, Cardinal Beaufort, and even the Earl of Warwick, not the kingmaker, trusted that Philip the Good could help make peace. Suffolk was also disposed to Philip and met with his ambassador regularly. Suffolk, likely with Henry VI's permission, was able to set up a meeting for Charles with the ambassador. He arranged their first meeting as a chance meeting. Yes, a small theatrical production. He had the ambassador show up when Charles was about to leave the room after their evening meal. Their conversation made it clear that Charles and Philip wanted peace and that both wanted Charles to act as part of the peace talks. Charles also wanted to make it clear that regardless of the rumors to the contrary, Charles loved Philip and didn't hold him responsible in any way for Louis, his father's death. In case I sound sarcastic, let me assure you I'm not, and neither was Charles. After the ambassador left, he was approached by one of Charles's guards. This guard had been chosen since he spoke French, and he happened to be a Burgundian. The guard wanted to second much of what Charles had said, and the ambassador told the guard to assure Charles of Philip's support on getting him released. Charles, at a later meeting with the ambassador, asked Suffolk if he could write to Philip. He made the mistake of asking in front of the ambassador. This would be a bit impolitique. Suffolk, thinking quickly, told Charles he should think on it until the next day. Hint, hint. <laughs> While Henry VI was willing to let Charles meet with the ambassador, writing a letter is a completely different thing. 
The next day, Charles was assured that Philip didn't hold Charles's brother responsible for fighting against him because they were supporting their sovereign. As part of this peace process, Charles submitted a document to English Parliament in August of 1434. It was written in legal Latin, which Charles had a grasp of. He wanted to help arrange a peace conference in October of 1434 in Normandy or Calais. He would see to it that the parties supporting Charles VII came. Some of these would only come to Normandy, including Yolande of Aragon, Brittany, and Armagnac, his brother-in-law. He could get Arthur of Richmond, Richmond's younger brother, Alençon, his son-in-law, and Clermont, who was now Bourbon, I'll remind you of that again, to meet in either Calais or Normandy. His peace plan was rather different than what will actually happen. He felt Charles VII could be persuaded to renounce his title if he were materially cared for. He even agreed to stay in England after the peace was made for a year or longer as a way to maintain this peace. Oh, and he was still willing to pay a ransom for his freedom. This offer to convince Charles VII to renounce his throne would actually lead to some condemning Charles. Just to point out, this is the Burgundian stance and has been for a rather long time, so it's a bit hypocritical of the Burgundians looking down at Charles. Henry VI, being aware of this letter, referenced it the following day. He had safe conduct letters for those listed, and again, the French failed to come. This might actually partially be Charles's fault. His invitations were a bit vague, just inviting his mates to meet him in Calais without being specific. While this was a good excuse for most of those invited, Philip the Good had been personally invited by Henry VI, which was probably a bad sign since, in theory, Henry was Philip's king. There is a better reason, though, that might have even tempted Philip to forsake Henry. In June 1434, remember, the meeting was meant to take place in October, Charles VII's evil counselors, yes, I love that phrase, were removed from his service. The specific counselor that was problematic wasn't evil, he was just incompetent. And he was replaced by Charles VII's brother-in-law. I know I haven't talked about him a lot as a king in battle, but, well, Charles VII is rather unimpressive in his own decisions. He often gives up when met with minimal resistance, and he needs to be carefully watched when traveling to meetings because he is known to run away back to one of his comfortable palaces. He, in general, is a reluctant king. His brother-in-law, along with Yolande, convinced Charles VII to hold his own council in July. During the period that the mix-up, or just ignoring Charles's invite, occurred, Bedford had returned to France to, well, try to deal with the victories Charles VII's party was having. With his return in July 1434, Philip the Good actually returned to the English cause after having almost joined the French side. This switch in allegiance would be short-lived, though. In January 1435, at a meeting with Clermont, Philip refers to Charles VII as his king. He set up a meeting in Arras for August 1435. He informed the English council in Paris that the French would not submit to an English king, not so much to scare the English, but to prepare them. The English, French, and Burgundians agreed to come to Arras. I won't go through the full list of those who attended, but just a smattering for the English. Henry Beaufort, William de la Pole, the Earl of Suffolk, John Holland, the Earl of Huntington, Henry VI's cousin. The Archbishop of York also attended. And the English brought two others, Charles and the Count of O, who were apparently kept in Calais and not brought to arrest. For the French, there was Clermont, again, now Bourbon, Richmond, and the Archbishop of Reims. And finally, the Burgundians were led by Philip the Good. The papal legate, Niccolo Albergati, would be acting as the mediator, Charles was, of course, hopeful that he'd get to go into France. Sadly, this didn't happen. The English simply wouldn't agree to the French proposal or really give any of their own other than Henry VI is king of France and England. Now, before you think they were just being stubborn, the French had offered Gascony, Guyenne, and Picardy, so Aquitaine, plus Normandy and a few other southwest French towns near Gascony. Oh, 
And they would give Henry VI one of Charles VII's daughters in marriage. The oldest was, I think, 10 at the most, and they were first cousins. They also wanted to give him a huge dowry. Honestly, it was a good deal, and all Henry VII had to do was renounce the French crown and make peace. Their last request was the most important, at least for Charles. It was for his freedom, purchased with a reasonable ransom. The English, though, had been told by Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, though that he really wanted the war to continue. Now, Humphrey wasn't being mean. He really was under the impression that he was supporting Henry V's goals and life's work. And had Henry V not died when he did, I could totally understand what Humphrey was doing. But Henry VI was not his father and would never be a warrior king. The English, unwilling to compromise in any way, left the Congress on the 6th of September. One week after they left, Philip the Good received dispensation from the papal legate for the Treaty of Arras. With this, Philip the Good made peace with Charles VII. While Charles VII and Philip were hammering out their treaty, the, the Treaty of Arras, Bedford, on the 14th of September, died. One rather interesting provision of the treaty was, due to Charles VII's involvement in John the Fearless's death, Philip the Good never had to pay the king homage, give him fealty, or answer a call to arms. He could choose to do these, but he was never required to do these. His son Charles was required to do all of this once Philip died, and Philip was required to do all of this for Charles VII's heir likely and factually the Dauphin Louis. Philip and Charles VII signed their treaty on the 20th or 21st of September, 1435. I can't really emphasize how important this treaty was to France's future. Remember in earlier episodes that I discussed how Henry V wouldn't have had nearly as much of a chance if the royal and Burgundian party had been in peace before he attacked? Now they were together, and they weren't facing the warrior king of Henry V, but the peaceful king of Henry VI, who was still a child. Following Bedford's death, Humphrey was able to convince the commons to keep the war going. In April of 1436, the bastard and Richmond made Paris a little less friendly for the English. That month, they scaled the walls of the city. They were kind enough to let the English leave peacefully. Of course, regardless of this, Charles was still stuck in England. It appears that during this time, he may have fallen in love. He wrote more lighthearted poetry. The woman's name is possibly Anne Mullins. There were women with that name, including Alice Chaucer's cousin, who visited their property. After all, he'd been through, I think it's lovely to think of him finally finding that bit of happiness. His poems during this time, at least his loved ones, are in English, which gives us the clue that the woman was likely English. And this poem may be his, so I'm going to read it for you. As with his French poems, his English poems are written in Middle English, so I'll use Modern English where it makes the meaning clear without ruining the poem. Alas, mercy, where shall mine heart find you? Never had he with you full acquaintances. Now come to him, and put his grievous. Or the be unto your friend unkind. Mercy, he hath ever you in his mind. Once let him have some comfort of pleasance. Alas, mercy, let him not die, but make at once amends. In all his woo and right heavy penance. Not is the help that while not his trust. Sloth his to me, and ever come behind. Alas, mercy. This and other poems written for this unknown Englishwoman may have been written after they were separated. And it's not as though the English would want him to marry, because that's part of being a prisoner. The reason the couple may have been separated is that Charles was moved in early 1436. The castle he was moved to was much smaller than Suffolk's, but it appears that he was still treated well. He would have felt left out of any peace negotiations going on. But things were going to start getting better for him soon. In 1436, Henry VI gave Charles a great offer. If he were able to raise 20,000 écus as a guarantee, he could go to France as part of peace negotiations. 
Charles did his best to raise it. His brother was on it immediately, selling properties that Charles had given him. Even Brittany offered to cover half this amount. During this, he, of course, had to keep raising funds for his brother John, because, yep, John is still stuck in England. The Pope had been writing to Henry VI, asking him to make peace, and in addition to being a kind man, Henry was a religious man who wanted to please the Pope. The money, though, hadn't arrived in July of 1437, when it was originally meant to come. The plan was changed for it to come in January 1438. During this period, Charles actually put the date on his poems, which is something he hadn't done previously. Due to this plan, Charles was about to have a meeting he must have wished for for the first moment he arrived in England. He got to see his brother John in November of 1437. Now imagine, John had been 12 when Charles had last seen him, and Charles had only been 17. Now 25 years later, John was 38 and Charles was 42 or 43. The meeting was as emotional as you could imagine. Sadly for Charles, the money hadn't arrived in January. Charles was quite popular with the English, and the English council also offered to put up the funds for him. For some reason, though, he decided not to go. He may have been nervous that Brittany wouldn't have been the best negotiator, and since he was sending a lot of the money, Brittany would be expected to be part of any negotiations. Charles, though, was able to meet with Henry VI not long after this negotiation fell apart. While being moved to a new residence, he was given an audience that was recorded. Charles expressed that he would like to go at a later date to help, and he thought Henry should ask for a truce. Henry agreed that Charles could go if funds were received by October 1438. Charles would get to leave on the 15th of February, 1439, if this happened. An interesting thing happened during these negotiations. John Beaufort, the Earl of Somerset and Lady Margaret Beaufort's father, was released after his ransom was paid off to O. When this John returned to England, he was given John of Orleans, Charles's younger brother. This meant that any further ransom payments received from John would go to John. While Henry VI was trying to get a truce, the bastard made it clear that Charles VII would only offer it when his ambassadors had a chance to talk to Charles. What's interesting about these negotiations is that Philip the Good was allowing his wife to manage his portion. His wife, if you're curious, was Isabella of Portugal. Her mother was Philippa of Lancaster, meaning Isabella was a cousin of Henry VI. There's a strong chance she spoke English, and we know she wanted peace. The meeting was finally set for the 6th of July, 1439. Charles was finally sent to Dover in May, and then on to Calais on the 26th of June. When he arrived, he had a second meeting with one of his brothers, this time the bastard. This brother had only been 11 when Charles was captured and had truly stepped up in his absence. Charles was meant to be able to leave Calais and meet on French soil. Sadly for him, a rumor had started that Fleming and Picardy agents were going to rescue Charles, so he was kept in Calais. Thankfully, the French delegates were given safe conduct letters to enter Calais, so they could converse with Charles during various points of the conference. The meeting sadly started out badly. Humphrey had kind of poisoned the well before the ambassadors had left. The English started off by calling Charles VII Charles of Valois, which the French didn't take kindly to. The English then acted as though they were confused by two of the aims of the negotiations, the release of Charles and peace. And again, the English would not give up the French throne. They offered a joke of concessions. On the 12th of July, Charles met his most surprising supporter, Isabella of Portugal, the wife of Philip the Good. She deeply wanted his freedom and would do much to make it happen, and it's very odd because at the end of the day, she is actually a Lancastrian. Isabella's suggestion for peace was actually pretty good, especially considering everything that had gone on over the last hundred years. A temporary peace would be offered for 15 to 30 years, depending on the negotiations. During this time, Henry VI couldn't use the title King of France. Once this peace had ended, 
Either side needed one year notice before restarting war. Sadly, the written contract said that Henry VI needed to give up his French possessions during this time. Charles is actually unimpressed by this underhanded tactic. The conference adjourned on the 29th of July and was set to resume on the 11th of September. Charles, of course, remained under strict guard in Calais. Charles VII did announce that he couldn't agree to anything until his next council meeting, which would happen on the 25th of September. While the French were away, the English ambassadors went home and returned with a letter saying peace wouldn't work. They had Humphrey to thank for that. The second meeting didn't happen, but Isabella was allowed to meet with Charles one more time. She promised to keep working for his freedom. Through her, he was also finally able to communicate with Philip the Good, and she proposed the dates for a second conference. Upon his return to England, Charles was given an audience with Henry VI and learned he would be freed. Henry had learned of the failures of the peace talks and was unhappy. He personally wrote to Isabella of Portugal and agreed to her proposed later dates. He informed Charles that once his financial affairs and ransom had been paid, he would be free. Charles immediately contacted Philip the Good and asked for financial assistance. He also wrote to his brother, the bastard, Charles VII and his queen and the Dauphin, the future Louis XI, for help. And then he just had to wait. Oh, and deal with Humphrey. Humphrey, again, wanting to uphold Henry V's will and wishes, tried to convince Henry VI not to let Charles go. Humphrey also wrote a scathing attack of Cardinal Beaufort, whom you may remember is his uncle. He further suggested that Charles would become King of France because Charles VII and the Dauphin couldn't get along. And he is 100% right on the couldn't get along part. There is a possibility that Henry VI didn't send ambassadors back to Calais in 1440. During all of this, Charles VII was dealing with his son, and Philip the Good, and Alençon, and others in the Progery Uprising. Thankfully, Charles VII won, but it was a bit messy for a moment. Richmond actually helped crush this rebellion. Through all of this, though, all of these men were trying to raise funds for Charles. It, it is a bit odd. And on the 2nd of July, 1440, Charles and Henry VI traded letters of freedom. Charles VII ratified the Treaty of Liberation on the 16th of August. And finally, the payment was made in the end of October. And with that, on the 3rd of November, Charles was declared free. As part of his release, in addition to his huge ransom, he had also been asked to bring peace between England and France within a year of his release. Charles obviously didn't just hop on a ship back to Orléans. That's not really possible. Instead, he sailed to Gravelines. He was greeted by the Archbishop of Rennes and his brother, the Bastard. He also saw Philip the Good for the first time in 25 years. To Philip, he said, quote, By my faith, fair brother and cousin, I ought to love you above all other princes of this realm. My fair cousin, your wife, for if you and she had not existed, I should have remained for even in danger from my enemies, and I have found no better friend than you. End quote. These kind words would probably upset at least one of Charles's supporters, like a specific one in Paris, the king. Philip did express that he felt so bad that it had taken so long. With that return to France and a heartfelt apology, I'm going to stop here. I promise not to leave you hanging. Next week, I'll be going through, well, the things that happen once Charles gets back to France. I hope you'll join me for that, and I'll see you then. Thank you for listening to Past. I can be found on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at PastPod. That's P-A-S-S-E-D-P-O-D. Please feel free to email me at pastpod at gmail.com. I have a Patreon that can be found at patreon.com backslash pastpod.